Thank you very much, Florence, and, and, and thank you for actually giving me the opportunity to, to, to share with you some thoughts about this new piece of legislation. And you may actually think that it's Friday morning, it's about data privacy. I'm a media lawyer, so I'm not going to bother. I'm going to take about a 30-minute mental break now. Bad idea, uh, because it is indeed something that, whether we like it or not, it is having an impact on our daily activities as a media company, as a, as, of course, as a technology company. But especially for media companies, I, I've noticed throughout the past that, that quite often data protection was not really a main focus area for compliance for different reasons. Because the first reason was always, well, we as a media company, we do not, we, we share information, we broadcast, we do not collect information. But this, of course, is not true any longer. We are making use of, 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 of websites, interactive websites. We engage on interactive television, interactive television advertising. We are uh, launching apps in web shops to, to, to be as interactive as possible. So, of course, nowadays, and already since a few years, we all know, as a media company, we are as active in collecting information, processing information, as in sharing information. And so that's why it is indeed important to take into account the new rules on data protection and privacy. And Florence, as you mentioned before, it's a new piece of legislation. It's the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Only last week, the 25th of May, it has entered into force. So it's a kind of a new piece of legislation. And yes, of course, it's elaborating on that old piece of legislation that we already know by heart, the, the, e or the privacy or the data protection directive, uh, uh, which is already older than 20 years old. Well, this is the one that is replacing the data protection directive, the directive that has been or had been transposed into the national laws of the 28 member states. So this one is going to replace no more national laws on privacy and data protection? Well, no, of course not. Yes, it is a regulation. It's one single piece of legislation throughout the European Union, but it wouldn't be the European Union with a regulation with many exceptions and many possibilities for member states to still make some national deviations or national specificities. On employment law, for example, labor law, but also uh, dedicated to media, especially freedom of expression. There's a very specific article stating that countries, member states, they do have the right to come up with very specific national laws that would actually uh, um, protect freedom of expression, freedom of information, in case it would be infringed by data protection rules, as you will see in a minute. Now, what is in this GDPR? Quite a lot. It contains 99 articles, instead of 30 that we had with the directive. So it has tripled. Not a surprise. We don't, we don't need to worry too much. There is a lot of administrative stuff, on, as in the media sector as well, about setting up a data protection authority, European Data Protection Board, so quite a lot of, of these things. Um, but still, it is 99 articles. And it is also supported, as usual, with almost 200 recitals explaining what actually was meant by the rules in the regulation. Very important to read the recitals because they contain quite some useful information how to interpret it. As always, of course, but especially here, if you compare them, there is quite a lot of, 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 of important information to be found there. It is also, it's also going into the history of the most lobbied piece of legislation ever any idea how many amendments have been introduced in the European Parliament? 3,999 uh, amendments. Crazy. Well, now we end up with, do you re with the result, the regulation. I don't know if you already took the time to read it. It's an interesting piece of legislation. It takes quite some time. And I'm afraid uh, that there is a lot of, it, it's not the end of discussions because it's not uh, written in a way, can you imagine, after more almost 4,000 amendments, it's not a consistent piece of legislation and it's not a very clear piece of legislation. But that's how we have to work with it. 
Um, and I would like to use the next 25, 30 minutes to guide you or to take you on a journey on actually what this GDPR could mean for us as a media company, as a media organization. No time, of course, to go through each of the articles, so I just picked out the most important hotspots, the, the, the legal hotspots. And, and as, uh, th this probably doesn't mean anything to you, uh, but uh, the good news, in 30 minutes, it will mean a lot to you. Um, and I just thought, well, everybody's talking about GDPR, let's stick to the acronyms and let's use some acronyms that, that we could use for some important new rights for end users, new obligations for us as organizations, also new sanctions, as you will see in a minute. The first thing maybe to, 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 to come is, is, what's the material scope? What is actually this regulation covering? And are we falling within this scope? Well, actually not too much has changed if you compare it with the old directive. It is about processing of personal data. And processing is any kind of activity using automated means, even not automated, not automated if it's in a logical order, but of personal data. And the definition of personal data hasn't really changed. It is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Any information relating to. This means and this is very often a discussion with colleagues in the United States, that it's not, as in the US, what is being called PII, personally identifiable information. We in Europe, it's much, much broader. It's not just about name, picture, about account numbers, it's anything. And I want to give you one example. Um, and I, I quite often, it's, it's quite a new example. There is, uh, some of us have probably already making, have made use of Uber, uh, the taxi company. Well, of course, they do collect some information, but they also collect the following data of our cell phone, the battery status. Who cares? They can have my battery. They, they, I, don't, I don't mind. It's not, under US law, it's not even personally identifiable information. It's just 10%, 15%, 20%. Probably they need it for any kind of technical purposes. Well now, since last week, it has come out that Uber is using that information for a very specific purpose. We still don't care be about battery status because it's not personal information, we think. Well, they are using it because they have, based on big data analytics, they came to the conclusion that people having a battery status lower than 20% are more eager to pay for a taxi drive 10 times more than somebody with a battery status of plus 80%. So that means that there is a concern for us, and I do, I, I must admit that the moment I knew that, before I order an Uber taxi, I first plug in uh, into the electricity socket, because I, I wanna, but just to show you, it's, it's one example that yes, it is, it could have an impact on the daily life of, 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 of everybody, and so that's exactly the kind of type of processing activities where the uh, European policymakers said, we have to pay attention there. It's not that it's not prohibited, but it's all about transparency, as we will see also in a minute. We have to, as organizations, we have to explain in a transparent, clear way what's the type of data we're going to collect and what are the purposes for which we are going to collect that kind of data. So that is about uh, the material scope. It, yes, it's still the same processing of personal data, but we have to pay attention. It's very broad. Next one, it's territorial scope. Not too much has changed there either, although. Before it was very simple, well, in, in theory, it was stating whenever you are a data controller, and a data controller is the organization who collects, who decides upon the purposes and the means of the data processing activity, well, if you're the data controller and you're established in one of the European Union member states, then you need to apply the rules whether you're collecting data from people in China, in the United States, whether those people are concerned or bothered about it, it doesn't matter. If you're established in the EU and you're a controller, then you need to take that into account. The second rule was that you're not established as a data controller in the EU, but you're actually making use of instruments 
which are based in the European territory servers, or you're working with a data processor, etc., then you also need to take that into account. A lot of issues around it, uh, a lot of uh, interpretations, case law, etc., we know about that, no time to go into that, but actually, the policymakers, they said, let's make it easier and the territorial scope, let's define it differently. From now on, with the GDPR, the rules are as follows. If you are a data controller and you're established in the European Union, yes, you need to apply the rules. If you're a data processor, which means that you're just a kind of vendor to somebody else, you're a Microsoft or you're a telecom uh, Deutsche T systems or anything, if you're a processor, you're based in the European Union, whomever you're providing your services to, you need to apply the European data protection rules. And then secondly, if you are not established in the EU, you don't have ever, you, you know, don't have any plans to, 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 to establish a company, an entity, a branch, whatever, a presence in the EU, but you offer products or services over the internet to European customers, you have to apply the European data protection rules. B2B or B2C, doesn't matter. And lastly, even if you don't sell products or services, but you collect data, you're based in India, but you're collecting data on European territory for profiling purposes, you also have to apply the rules of data protection. So as you can see, territorial scope, very broad. The extraterritorial scope of the data protection regulation is to be taken into account, not just by us, but by also companies, foreign companies. Then I come to a, another point, which is EC or explicit consent. What does it mean? Well, we all know because we know for 20 years now that data protection rules, they require to have a legal basis. Before you can collect data and further process those data, you need to have a legal basis. It's a kind of list in the old directive. Consent, you, necessary for the performance of the agreement, etc., etc. Well, Throughout the years, we as organizations, we all had very creative interpretations of what could be consent. Implicit consent, implied consent, consent somewhere in Article 5.4 of the terms and conditions in, in a very small uh, uh, font, nobody can read it. You consent by making use of our service, etc., etc. Well, the European uh, uh, policy maker, the European Commission said this should be finished. When we talk about consent, it should be very clear that it is explicit consent. And I'm just going to read out loudly the definition of what is consent. Um, consent. So it doesn't, it, it's the, the basic definition of consent, so without explicit before. It's just consent from now on is any freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes by which he or she, by a statement or by a clear affirmative action, signifies agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her. So it should be freely given, specific, informed, and an active action of the end user. No implied consent any longer is gonna, uh, uh, um, uh, that will be prohibited. It should be given for each purpose separately. So not just using the data and then using it afterwards for another purpose. You need to inform them about the different purposes. And it's up to us as organizations to prove that we got consent. So we need to start working with a database, an opt-in database, so that afterwards when somebody says, I never consented my data to be given to that organization, that you can say, oh yes, we have audit trails. We have got log files showing that you, at that moment, gave consent for that very specific purpose. So that about consent, which has now become explicit. Another issue is, and that is something new, um, and Eva Levens, my colleague from the University of Leuven, yesterday already referred to that, that is there is now a specific introduction relating to the processing of personal data of minors. This was one of the most amended piece of legislation, and at the end, I must say, it depends on how you look at it, I would say it's still a very business-friendly uh, article, uh, because the, the articles before that were proposed by the Commission, that were amended by the European Parliament, actually were much more 
minor friendly, well, I wouldn't say minor friendly, but at least uh, because miners wouldn't be able to do anything anymore, but um, it's, it was much more difficult for, for, for companies. Now, how does it work now? The magical age limit is 16. If and only, it's on, only for very specific data processing activities, namely, if you are offering online services, information society services, huh? if you're offering information society services to an end user who has not the age of 16 yet, and the, pr the legal basis that you use is consent, so not legitimate interest or performance of the agreement, you use consent, well, you cannot provide a service if that, uh, based on the consent of the minor if that person has not reached the age of 16 yet. You will have to ask the parent's consent or the custodian. And in the media sector, we have so many, th think about broadcasting companies, you do have dedicated applications, dedicated data processing activities relating to children, for children programs, apps, uh, games, etc., etc. Under the age of 16, you need to have. Now, you also, um, countries, and this is, could be a national deviation, countries can lower even the age, but it can never be lower than 13. So what we're going to see, and especially if you're active in cross-border data processing activities, it could be that in Spain you will have to ask uh, custodi custodians or parents' consent uh, of children under the age of, of uh, 15, but in others 16, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to take that 15. You have to take that into account. Now we come to a new kind of uh, obligation or right, depends on how you look at it, and this is not the French speaking, the old uh, uh, French uh, or Belgian uh, RTBF, uh, Radio Television Belge Française, Francophone. It's the right to be forgotten. <laughs> It's a new right being introduced. We already had it with the Google case law, as you know, uh, for search engines, but now that kind of case law has really been broadened to any kind of data processing activity. Namely, we as end users, we have the right to claim from organizations to have our data deleted or anonymized under certain conditions, and these conditions are summed up in the, uh, in the legislation. For example, you don't consent any longer to the use of those data, you can ask them to be, you can ask to be forgotten. A link back to the minors. Well, every person has the right to ask from an organization to have your data deleted that have been collected through you, uh, from you, up to the age of 16. You don't need to explain, you know, don't need to come up with arguments, you just can say, these are, these are data before the age of 16, I know I was very dumb and I was naive and I did stupid things, well, please delete the information up to the age of 16. This, I forgot to mention that, Yes, it entered into force, this GDPR, last week, 25th of May, but we do have a transition period of 24 months. So all the rules I'm explaining now, we need to prepare now to make sure that you have the right processes in place, the right procedures in place, to make sure that on the 25th of May, 2018, everything can be launched. Next to the right to be forgotten is another new right, uh, and, of course, the old rights about right of access, right uh, uh, of rectification, they're still there in the regulation. So I only focus to some very new rights. And so next to the right to be forgotten, we have what is being called the data portability rights. Yes, we have the discussion also in the media sector with content portability. We used to have the discussion, and we know it, how it has been solved in the telecommunications sector with the number portability. Well, here it's exactly the same kind of philosophy that has been held by European policymakers. The data portability right means that if we, as end users, when we provide information proactively to an organization, so it's not about an organization getting information passively from us, 
uh, but we provide information to an organization. Think about social networks. Think about um, uploading all your pictures on, in a, on a cloud. Uh, think about uh, making use of an email service. That's the kind of services that are being covered by the data portability right. Well, we will always, as end users, have the right to ask that organization to get a copy in a structured, readable format from the organization to get a copy so we can actually use it ourselves or we can upload it to another service provider. So many of us have been, for example, investing hours and days of our lives on, on our Facebook profile. But maybe Facebook is, uh, maybe in two years' time, there's going to be a new kind of, of, of platform and everybody wants to move, but there is a vendor lock-in. No, wh why would you recreate your life again on that other social network? Well, this is exactly why this piece of legislation or this clause has been inserted in the GDPR, that you have the right to get a copy from a social network, from YouTube, from Facebook, but it could be much broader. It's not just a social network to get it and to upload it somewhere else. And it goes one step further, even the data portability right, stating that you can actually ask that organization not to send you a copy, but to share that information in a standardized, structured format directly to the new vendor of the services. So just the same thing as we know now with number portability, that actually the two telco operators, they need to solve the issue, and you want to make sure that you use the number. So that about data portability, right? Another new thing uh, that we didn't know yet, at least not at this level, is data breach. Data breach notification duties. It's a rule that we already know in some very specific sectors, the telecommunication sector, for example, uh, some uh, players in the, in, in the critical information infrastructure, like, uh, like the energy uh, providers, utilities, etc. They already have a data breach notification duty, but now it is going to be applied to any organization that is processing personal data. And what does the data breach notification duty mean? Well, it means that if you know this, that somebody hacked into your computer, what, well, into your computer system, or that for whatever reason data have been manipulated, or the data have been by a, a wrong instruction by one of the employees is out there, well, you need, without undue delay, and at the latest within 72 hours after you noticed about the data breach, you need to notify the Data Protection Authority That's a heavy burden. You need to make sure that you have procedures in place to do that and that you document these kind of things. Do you need to notify the data subjects, the end users whose data are probably out there? Well, there the data protection regulation has additional rules and states, well, if there is a high risk, it doesn't define, of course, what is high risk, but when there is a high risk for the uh, fundamental rights of the end user, you also need, without undue delay, you need to inform them. Then there are a few exceptions that you should go through. For example, if you can prove as an organization that yes, there was a data breach, but all data have been encrypted, for example, so no worries, then you don't need to inform the end users, the data subjects, but you need to document it. Then I come to another new kind of principle and it's, a, it's kind of, it's, it's a very important principle that uh, now has been uh, uh, explained in, um, um, uh, in the regulation, which is the principle of privacy by design. Actually now it says, the regulation says data protection by design. And what is data protection by design? Well, it is actually the, the obligation for us, companies, organizations, to make sure that already from the beginning of a new project where data processing, personal data processing is going to involve, that already from the beginning you take into, into account the privacy requirements. And so privacy should not become as an afterthought. And there are so many examples, and I'm sure that you also have many examples where, where especially as you are from the legal department, that actually business people or people from departments, the R&D, they, they have spent lots of hours, days, weeks, months 
years maybe on developing a new product and just before it's being rolled out we still need a kind of legal scrutiny test and so then you just have until Monday to actually sign off and then you say oh my god but you should have come earlier to me because this is completely against the rules on privacy you should it should be privacy by default and not just uh, um, so you can't just collect as much data as you want it's not you didn't think about it so you have to go back to the drawing table and that of course is an issue for many organizations and that's why the new obligation has come up that we need to ensure that in the roadmap of a new product development a new service development that in the roadmap already in the beginning in the design phase that data protection rules are being taken into account Think of automotive uh, or with uh, connected cars. Think of, of all these applications that are out, etc., etc. And that that brings me to, and I only have a few minutes left. I notice um, that brings me to another new kind of obligation, and this also relates to the magic word of the regulation, but I haven't mentioned that yet, which is accountability. It's all about accountability now. And what does it mean? Well, it means that. The European regulator is of the opinion that we as organizations, we are the best to know how to deal with, how to implement in practice these kind of rules, these kind of principles. And so they throw the ball to us. They say, well, you actually, we're going to tell you the principles in the regulation, but it's up to you to implement it in a practical way, and you will have to convince us. You will have to, come to make sure that you can, in a documented way, that you can prove as an organization that you take into account those rules on consent, the, the, the rules on getting information from, from uh, minors, that you have a procedure for right to be forgotten, etc. And so the next one, the PIA, or the Privacy Impact Assessment, is also a very good example of this accountability principle because it says, and again, I have here PIA, but now I, since last week I also need to say DPIA, namely Data Protection Impact Assessment. And what is this Data Protection Impact Assessment? Well, it's an obligation for us, organizations, that again, just as with Privacy by Design, that actually Whenever we start a project of which we think there is a risk from a data protection perspective here, because we are collecting massively personal data, because it's, it's processing sensitive data, like medical data, healthcare, these kind of things, well, then we need to engage on a data protection impact assessment. And it's a very specific process in which we need, and we need to document it, we need to put it on paper, that what are the kind of data that we are going to process. For which purposes? Do we really need all those data for these purposes? Or can we do it with less data? The data minimization principle. How long are we going to keep the data? Etc. Etc. In certain occasions, you will even have to ask representatives, consumer representatives, representation, representative organizations for their input, for their feedback. In certain occasions, you will have to go to the data protection authority in your country to discuss these kind of things. So it's an important thing, data protection impact assessment, and you need to document it so that in case something goes wrong, you have something to tell. You can say, we did what we had to do. We followed best practices. You can read it here in our impact assessment. And that goes together with another kind of obligation. It's a new function being created in most countries, the DPO, the Data Protection Officer. Most organizations, that are active in processing personal data at a huge scale, and I believe media companies would be, would be part of that, you will have to appoint a data protection officer. And that's a kind of independent person, could be within the company, you could also outsource it. And that person is going to make sure that the rules, the, GD, the GDPR rules are really becoming part of the culture of the organization. And so that's the kind of ombudsman within the organization, it's the spokesperson to the data protection authority, etc. So the DPO is going to become a very important function. The problem is they don't exist. Because it is the profile of a DPO is somebody having a legal background and a technical background, knowing everything about information security, project management, and the law. 
not too many people do have that kind of thing. So what we see happening is that nowadays many people are asking, should it be somebody with a technical profile or should we appoint a lawyer of the team as a DPO? It's not clear yet. And so many courses are being organized for, for doing that kind of things. And then I come to, to one of the final things that who cares? Why should we really? This is, well, again, one of those European rules that nobody applies and that nobody, that we didn't comply with the Data Protection Directive for 20 years. We have never had any issues, so why should we bother? Well, the European Commission was fully aware that we as organizations, we didn't always take it as seriously, the data protection principles. And that's why they said, and they made very specific statements, and I remember here Giovanni Buttarelli from the EDBS a few months ago, who, who explained that we wanted to make sure that this was taken as seriously as competition law by organizations. And that's why that a heavy sanction mechanism has been appended to it. Heavy, and this is, this is the worst case scenario, namely, if you infringe the rules, not all, but some rules, it's a set of about five, but many pr basic principles of the GDPR, you can be sanctioned with a sanction of 4% of your global annual turnover, your worldwide annual turnover. That can be a lot of money. And that means that companies who, for example, are residing in the United States and they just have one branch somewhere in a small country like Belgium or in Cyprus with just five people maybe. Well, if those five people in the Belgian office screw up, that huge company can be sanctioned with a percentage of 4% of the global, the worldwide annual turnover. Um, and the thing is, this is not a court decision. It is the data protection authority. So it's an administrative sanction. And as this always is the case, so it means that, and I, I do have good contacts with data protection authorities, they are very, very good in what they do. It is enforcing data protection compliance but not necessarily taking into account business requirements, incentives, other legislation, et cetera. So I am I'm actually concerned that because it's the data protection authority that come up with such a kind of sanction that many, many organizations could be confronted because we know in some jurisdictions you have very assertive, even aggressive data protection authorities than in others. You will notice that the 25th of May 2018, probably some of them would like to show how powerful they have become and, and threatened with such kind of sanctions. Brings me to one of the last points, uh, Florence, which is the, uh, the so-called one-stop shop principle. Because many of us as organizations, we have an office in, 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 in Germany, we have one in Italy, we have a branch maybe in Spain, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We are active cross-border level. Are all those data protection authorities going to be able to enforce their uh, the, uh, the legislation on us, or would it not be much easier for us as an organization working at cross-border level to have just one point of contact, one data protection authority who could be our main, our core point? This was one of the most important questions uh, or, or requests from businesses that they said, now it's too difficult. Uh, it's too difficult for us to deal with the Italian DPA, with the French uh, DPA, etc. We want to have one spokesperson on the other side. And so that's the one-stop shop principle or the single data protection authority principle that has been introduced. Namely, it is actually the data protection authority of the country in which you have your main establishments. That would be your point of contact, your single point of contact. But then, of course, there was quite some consternation, especially from the other side, the customer side, who said, but does it mean now that if I'm an Italian end user, I'm having an issue with a French company, a media company that is collecting my data, do I need to go to the French CNIL, explain in French what is my issue, and then they will take it up? No. So there is, has been taken, that has been taken into account into the sense that, in the sense that you as an end user, you can go to your local data protection authority, the Italian DPA, the Garante, for example, and 
DPA in Italy will then get in touch with the French CNIL and they will solve the issue themselves and so they will, you will actually as an entity be represented by the Italian DPA, the organization will be represented by the uh, uh, French DPA. And then in order to make sure that actually all these DPAs in those 28 member states and it's not just 28 data protection authorities, much more because we know in Germany every state, for example, has a DPA, and so there are much more than just 28 DPAs. Well, in order to make sure that they do um, apply the rules in a European-wide way, in a consistent way, uh, the European Data Protection Board has been set up. For those um, who know about the old directive, this is actually the reincarnation of the old Working Party 29. Mm -hmm. but it's a much nicer name, the EDPP, than the WP29. And that brings me to just one final thing, that is, it, it's great to, 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 to act, be active in data processing, we do collect data, but actually, of course, we also transfer data, because the internet is there, it's cross-border, so we quite often we work together with uh, vendors on the other side of the ocean, we work with cloud providers, we, we have support services in some exotic countries, so the data that you collect from the end users are quite often not stored any longer on the servers somewhere within your own location, within your own jurisdiction. There is a data transfer. And that, of course, has been dealt with before in the directive, and these rules we still find in the data protection regulation. For those of us who thought that, well, the European policymakers would probably have taken into account the reality that data flows cross-border and that the rules would have become more flexible, they're wrong. The rules are as stringent as before, and I'm even concerned that we are going now into a completely other direction of uh, um, uh, local localization of uh, personal data. Uh, because, as you know, I refer here to Safe Harbor. Uh, we all know that uh, since quite some time, because of uh, the, um, um, the court case uh, against Facebook of Max Krem, that the Court of Justice has invalidated Safe Harbor, um, which is the data transfers to, between Europe and the United, and, and United States, certain occasions, etc. Well, there are different alternatives that we can use instead of safe harbor for transferring data, in this case, to the United States. For example, model, model contracts, these contracts that have been drafted by the European Commission and uh, which are actually proactively or have been endorsed by the European Commission as if you have a contract between a data exporter in Europe and a data importer on the other side of the world and you follow those rules, you don't deviate from those rules, you follow the model clauses, well, then you're fine. Well, what happened last week? In the similar case of Facebook, the Irish Data Protection Authority has again sent a prejudicial question to the Court of Justice about the legal validity of such model contracts. And if the Court of Justice is consistent in its thinking and they invalidated Safe Harbor, I think they should also invalidate the model contracts. And that would I, I think that would be, would be very, very, would be crazy because then it would mean that unless you can say it's for the, uh, um, it's, it's necessary for the performance of the agreement to transfer the data, or if you ask for consent from the end user, there will be no way any longer to transfer data outside of the European Union, European Economic Area, which could have an immediate effect, and we see it already happening now, I see it with many of my clients, an immediate effect on the way how services are being offered, especially in the cloud. We see that huge international companies nowadays, they make partnerships with local European cloud players so that they can promise that personal data collected in Europe stay in Europe, but you, that you still have the advantage of cloud computing, etc. So this actually brings me to the end, the last one that is, I forgot to mention, that is the privacy shield, which is the new kind of agreement, there is already political agreement, but it's not, um, it's not finalized yet, that is the kind of replacement of safe harbor, and so the privacy shield is going, that, that's at least the intention, would be the alternative for transferring data from Europe to the United States if those companies based in the US would adhere to the rules of the privacy shield. And as you already hear in the terms, 
safe harbor privacy shield, there is a, a shift of focus from a safe harbor for companies to receive data in the United States to the privacy shields. We as European citizens, we actually shouldn't worry if a company adheres to the rules, our privacy will be shielded by this new agreement. But let's see how it goes and I am almost sure that the moment that the privacy shield will be put in place, there's going to be an Austrian student who will bring that before the Court of Justice in Europe. Thank you very much.